Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. After the Red Wings game yesterday, I thought, man, this has been such a fun day of hockey, partly because the Red Wings didn't play forever and it was just good to see Red Wings hockey again, and partly because obviously the unreal finish, Wallman penalty shot OT winner hits the gritty. That is just that is just like drunk belligerent fan wrote that script, just pure dude's rock energy. And then after watching the rest of the Atlantic Division play out, I thought, no, yeah, this actually is the funniest, best day of hockey so far this year by far it was the best of times it was the worst of times if you logged on to twitter at any point yesterday oh I, hey look as a neutral party as someone who wanted both ottawa and toronto to lose and suffer equal amounts it was the best of times and it was the best of times i read all the opinions the good ones the bad ones i loved all of it every second of it i was jim from the office looking through the blinds just smirking <laughs> at it that was the funniest thing through and through like from the moment Ridley Gregg wound up full bore for a clapper from five feet out to seeing Morgan Riley chase him down just grin ear to ear the entire time I think this term gets thrown around a little too liberally these days but watching Ridley Gregg wind up on that one rock star shit it is rock star shit <laughs> Oh, we have we have a lot to say about that, just because it's the funniest thing in the world. Uh, Evan is here with us. Evan, you, you, he jumped. Did you see when I said his name? He jumped. I am up. here. You're right. You are right. Evan, Physically, yes. Mentally, maybe. He wasn't actually at the Waste Management Open this weekend, but if you looked at him and talked to him at all today, you might think so. I got a little Allura voice right now. Yeah. I played in a charity hockey tournament this weekend, and let me tell you. There's a lot of charity. The bar bill after last night. Went to a good cause, <laughs> and I am feeling it. But we came out as champions, so uh, it was all worth it. Godspeed to you this episode. Yes. Does a tournament championship count unless you're violently hung over during the championship game? Our change room smelled terrible before <laughs> and after. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast, folks. Here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, the violent world of the NHL. And lots more. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we're going to be recapping Detroit's return to play as their all-star break and then uh, so-called bye week finished. And they came back with a game against the, uh, at the moment, uh, league best Vancouver Canucks. And we're going to be recapping that game. Pretty eventful game from first through third with a lot of different storylines for the Red Wings. Raymond uh, Zadorov suspended uh, to bring it through the Gloves down again. Mo Sider may have saved the game. Wallman's goal, etc. Uh, we'll be talking about some stats and some storylines and milestones from that game, and then taking a look at uh, where Detroit is left at now that the the break is over and they're in the kind of final phases of the season, uh, making a real, real playoff push here. Uh, and then we're gonna jump right to NHL news because obviously the Toronto Ottawa incident yesterday is the talk of the town. Uh, funny though it is, we'll try to discern some objective rational opinions from it and see what might happen with Morgan Riley as he's been offered an in-person hearing uh, for a potential suspension upcoming and then we'll give you some updates on the Grand Rapids Griffins and Red Wings prospects and more news from the Detroit Red Wings world and the rest of the NHL but first I want to let you know that Saturday March 2nd is winged wheel podcast night at the LCA that is a partnered event between us and the Detroit Red Wings where we host a live episode of the Winged Wheel podcast at Little Caesars Arena on the same day as the Red Wings versus Panthers game. It's the sixth time we've run this event. It's a fantastic event. Uh, just a quick note before I get into details, the time of the game has changed to 3 p.m. So we'll give you details on when the live recording of the podcast is compared to the game uh, and all other logistical details as we work that out with the Red Wings. Uh, but the details of the event, you get access to not only the Red Wings versus Panthers game, but you also get access to the live recording of the Winged Wheel podcast. It's going to feature special guest Ken Daniels, lead announcer of the Detroit Red Wings, and other special guests. There's going to be an opportunity to buy food or drinks. There's going to be merch available. Uh, you're going to sit in special Winged Wheel podcast seating sections, and a portion of the proceeds from every ticket sold benefits the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Also, the first 400 ticket buyers get a special co-branded Detroit Red Wings and Winged Wheel podcast cap. So again, Winged Wheel podcast night at the LCA, Saturday, March 2nd. 
Detroit versus Florida, wingedwheelpodcast.com slash Red Wings, or go to the link in the description to get your tickets. There are not that many remaining for the first 400 that get the cap, so uh, make sure to get them fast, wingedwheelpodcast.com slash Red Wings. Okay, Detroit came back from a long break, a much needed break, heading into the All-Star game, and then Detroit had their you know so-called bye week to extend how long they had off. I believe it was nine days before they played a matinee against Vancouver at home in hockey town. And, you know, as much as we made fun of Vancouver and say, oh, they're on a PDO bender, blah, blah, blah. You can't deny that they're among the best teams in the league right now. So some people were messaging saying this is a scheduled loss, especially as the second period was happening. They were saying this is a scheduled loss. This team is too good for Detroit to handle. They're exposing Detroit's flaws. But I was pleasantly surprised considering what Detroit's shortcomings have been what their woes have been this year, that they were able to come out with the performance they did, especially in the first period against Vancouver. Yeah. What uh, is the saying we've had going on for a few months now? Just win. Just win, baby. Yeah, it wasn't a masterful game by any means, but it's kind of been a prototypical Red Wings game this year. There was a stat going around I saw yesterday, don't have the exact numbers, but the Red Wings were near the top of the league in terms of third period comebacks. I believe they have seven and they are among uh, tied for second in the league. I think eight is the highest. Yeah, that sounds right, which tells me two things. One, this is an extremely resilient team who, you know, never gets off their horse. They believe they're in every game. And it tells me, too, they're trailing a lot going into the third period. It's the dichotomy of the, this year's Red Wings where they don't often string together an awesome 60 minutes, but they find a way to get it done. I think we all could agree here that one stretch, that seven, that infamous seven minute stretch in the second period might have been their worst seven minutes of the season. At least it was up there. And then they're going into the third period, two goals down against one of the best teams in the league. And we're here talking about a win. So I, I think this entire game was the perfect encapsulation of what this team has been this year. And the fact that it was against such a strong opponent too, like this isn't a a game against the Columbus Blue Jackets or something where, yeah, they got the win, but you look back at the, the foe they were playing and you're like, eh, giving up a point there wasn't really acceptable. No, this is the Canucks there. <laughs> the Canucks are loading up for a potential cup run here, at least in their minds. Let's talk about the game. Detroit opened up, you know, less than a minute into their return to play and Lucas Raymond scored one of the goals of the year for the Red Wings. Like, that was just a phenomenal play. Someone uh, mentioned there, like, that was like a vintage when the Red Wings were loaded with players like Datsuk or even before Fedorov, like guys who could do that almost at will. That was an unreal goal by Lucas Raymond and blew the lid off the place within a minute of returning to play. That move, that little backhand tap under the defender's stick once they're turned around to the center of the ice, that's the Red Wings move. How many times have we seen Fedorov and Zetterberg especially utilize that move over the years? It's just, it's not an easy one to pull off because you have to time it well. And when you've got an actual giraffe chasing you on that one, <laughs> hey, the triangle, the pop, uh, the puck under the stick there is pretty big, but then the reach is also big. So you still have to get around that. And yeah, and he had the goalie dead to rights because I don't think this Smith thought he was getting that and by the time he caught up to it the smith is flat-footed and one step and he's staring at a wide open net petrie actually did a good job to start that play in his own zone with a, a smart pass out and then perron who was just trying to get it off the ice fed it over to raymond and then peeled off for the line change and then i'm sure he looked back and went oh nice thanks for the apple yeah so good raymond has been he's been hot man i think he has 14 points in his last 14 games He's on a little tear here. He's uh, in 2024. He's been really solid. He's been solid all year, but we were talking before an episode recently, Brad, where, you know, we were just discussing some stats and you're like, when did Raymond get that many assists? I'm like, he is in on so many goals quietly that people don't appreciate. Raymond is even when he's not lighting it up like he did yesterday, he's still on the score sheet a bunch. He's, he's having himself a nice season. Yeah. It's easy to forget. He's what turning 22 this year. St- We've talked about it before. He's still a kid. He's a baby. Yeah. Good for him. So that was uh, the first period ended uh, Red Wings up by one. So good effort overall. If you said, yes, you can go up against the Vancouver Canucks and be up by one goal after 20 minutes. That's an excellent result. And the second period got a bit weird. 
Niels Hoaglander scored his 15th goal of the year, uh, just over a minute in, and then it got ugly. Lucas Raymond took a hit up high from Nikita Zadorov. It was uh, not a good one. Raymond was very shaken up, had to, ended up skating off under his own power, a little wobbly, went down the tunnel for concussion protocol, thankfully returned later that game. Hopefully there's no lasting effects from that hit. Let's talk about the hit itself. That was, like, he got, Zadorov got five in a game, match penalty, they reviewed it, they kicked him out, and within, like, a few hours of the game ending, they had reviewed the play, Department of Player Safety, and suspended Zadorov for two games which I felt was in line with recent suspensions that they've had for hits to the head. Yeah, it wasn't as bad as Brendan Gallagher's, for example, but no. it was the same thing in the sense that it was a hit to the head. And, you know, the, the discourse on Twitter after both this one was completely insufferable, as all headshots are, where the argument was, okay, yeah, well, Raymond's like four foot two and Zadorov's like seven feet tall. How's he supposed to not hit him in the head? And my counter argument is to that is always there's 30 40 hits a game how many of them actually hit that almost none you think everyone is a six foot two guy hitting another six foot two guy guys can do it and then the argument comes up well what's he supposed to do in that situation not hit him yeah no if the if the only option is to hit him in the head you don't make the hit and if you can hit him in anywhere but the head light him up that's the answer yeah that's my thing like People take my stance on this as I'm very anti-hitting, very anti-violence. Oh, no, quite the opposite. I'm very pro-hitting, very (laughs) pro-violence. I I like this podcast. (laughs) Yeah. But the thing is, what we know about concussions, what we know about CTE, like, it's absurd people are arguing in favor of this in any capacity. Like, you are pro-concussion is what your argument is if you think this hits okay. If you can – and this one in particular, the angle is very important Mm -hmm. because – it's not like we've seen some where it's that gray area. You get a guy in the chest, but he's short, and then it rides up, and you end up catching him in the chin, and it's a bad hit all around. This was primary point of contact from an angle that Lucas couldn't have done anything about. Like It was straight to the head, blindside type angle, not fully because obviously uh, the angle he was coming in on wasn't that extreme, but it was the only play he had. So the correct answer was, should Zadorov have thrown the hit? No, there's a situation where sometimes players even like dip their heads or they start to fall forward or they're stick handling like way too low and just staring down at the puck or they they start to fall at the wrong time. Those are the situations where I think the discourse, though often irrational in terms of how it's delivered, it's agreeable that there is some kind of conversation about it. It's a violent game. Sometimes unfortunate stuff happens. This wasn't that case. Raymond it was an avoidable hit. I think Zadorov could have hit him without hitting him like that. Zadorov also missed Raymond. Like he caught, he kind of like glanced off of him and caught primarily his head. And if you saw the way his arm, his elbow was moving up, everything was just moving high. I think the refs got this right. They got it right when they reviewed it and the Department of Player Safety got it right. Clip that because I'm not going to say that very often. But through and through, I think, you know, Zadorov missed half the, or more than half the game, I think it was. And then two games after that, it, in my mind, the right call. Yeah, I think the penalty fit the crime. It, it, Zadorov, I think, totally missed time that play, and I think he probably went to go center mass on Lucas Raymond, but he just had bad timing and cl- got his head. And you know what? The onus is on him not to do that and not make that mistake, and he's he paid for it. I thought it was perfectly in line with uh, with what he got. Now, what happened after is interesting. So Detroit had a five-minute major. They didn't have Lucas Raymond for that, but again, they had a five-minute major power play, and nothing happened for most of that five-minute major. I think by the time they got a shot on, there was like so little time left, and it was just, they couldn't even get set up. They were just disjointed. It wasn't looking good. And then with very little time left in that five-minute major, there was a puck that went up in the air, and former Detroit Red Wing Philip Peronik took a two-handed swing in the air at the puck, like just the stupidest. <laughs> Like I saw the replay and I went, damn, oh my God, like that he, that's cl- using your face. He clocked Dylan Larkin in the head. He's lucky he didn't catch him like clean in the teeth or anything. Otherwise Dylan Larkin would have very quickly had a lot of commercials with a denture company or something like that. Like it was, Larkin was lucky and Heronic was lucky that he didn't catch him worse. I'm sure it didn't feel great for Larkin. And so you're like, okay, five minutes gone right there. Here's another two minutes, pretty much almost seven minutes of power play. Nothing happened. 
just Detroit got nothing done, almost no danger, almost no control, really, that was threatening for a goal. The offensive chances weren't there. And then you're like, wow, what a turn of the tide. Seven minutes of killed power play by Vancouver consecutively. This That's is, impressive. It, it's extremely impressive by them. And then immediately they follow it up with Hronik leaves the box, goes on a breakaway, and tucks one in on Alex Line, and they go up 2-1. Yeah, that was one of those moments in the game where I, I penciled it in my mind for no matter how the rest of the game went, if the Red Wings lost, you could circle those seven minutes and go, this was the primary reason why they lost. Whether that's they lost all momentum or that Hronik goal ended up being the winning goal or whatever you want to classify it as. Because even from a motivation standpoint, your captain gets, you know, baseball batted to the head. One of your star wingers takes that cheap shot to the head. Like your motivation to make them pay is that like as high as it can be for a power play. And it was a chippy game too. Yeah. And it wasn't that the Red Wings didn't execute on the power play. It looked for a good stretch of it. Like they didn't give a shit. And I don't mean that in the sense like, oh, we don't want to score. Obviously that it's, we have five minutes. There's no urgency here. We can take all the time we need to set up in our own zone for the breakout. If we don't have the perfect entry, who cares? If we do get it set up, we got all the time in the world to pass it around. We don't need to move our feet, do anything weird, try any. Uh, Patrick Kane tried one cross seam pass, and that was about the only dangerous play on the entire power play. It was just unbelievable and i know lalone's not big on mid-game timeouts to you know go over a system or to send a warning if there would have been a whistle about three and a half four minutes into that power play i'm absolutely taking the timeout and just doing anything to get these guys to move their ass and then the fact that heronic gifted them an extra two minutes and they did even less with it that was jarring i i threw out a tweet about how it was Maybe the worst power play sequence in the history of the Detroit Red Wings is someone. <laughs> You're so dramatic, dude. <laughs> and then someone, uh, seven minutes, someone pointed out all of San Jose's shorthanded goals earlier this year, to which it's San Jose, yes. That's a great You point. said this year. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, though, that wasn't seven minutes of tragedy, so I could be I could be swayed either way on this argument, but... It wasn't good. It was. Again, it's not that they didn't score on the 7 nothing. Sometimes you run into a hot goalie. Sometimes you run into a top PK. It's going to happen. It's that at no point in that seven minutes did they even threaten. There was not the opportunity for a goal. They didn't even get that far along in their whatever the hell they were doing. It was just, we're going to regroup a million times. We're going to turn it over a million times. And when we get set up, we're going to have five guys not moving their feet. And we're just going to kind of chuck the puck around aimlessly. And shocking that that didn't work. The worst part is, like, yeah, Hirona came out and scored, and then Pedersen scored just uh, over a couple minutes after that. 3-1, and I thought, to your point about Lalone not calling, you know, mid-game timeouts, I have a lot of praise for the way Lalone has changed this team's mentality and how they approach being down in games. But one thing that I still wonder about is, can these timeouts mitigate some of these like mental lapses because you know we talk about how detroit is getting the results they're still not a perfect team very few in the nhl are if any uh, and, and one of their flaws is that despite the talent and the capacity to perform that they have they often get in these ruts and then they hang in there for longer than they should there have been multiple you know this season or even recently second period we'll call them collapses not total collapses not we're not talking collapses like the 2019 or 2020 red wings or whatever but, I mean, the game gets away from them when they should have had control. This seven-minute power play turning into conceding two goals right after being a case in point. At any given point in there, what does it hurt to call a timeout and just try to get the team to, like, just settle them down and go, look, put it all away, treat it as 0-0, zero, zero, whatever you need to do, forget it. Like, you need to get your shit together. This is your barn. You have control. You just, you were up one nothing after 20 minutes. Don't be scared. of the, Whatever you need to say. And just get the team to breathe. Luckily, though, they escaped the second period down two. And then I thought, well, they've come back in the third before. As Brad opened the show with, they have seven third period comebacks this season now. They can do it. And they have before. And they just have to rely on, on doing what they need to do in the third. And that's what I think they did. So ultimately, I would have loved to have seen the timeout there. But you do have to hand it to 
Lalone and the Red Wings, like they still managed to to get it done in the third. It was uh, a couple of key goals. First of the two was uh, a power play goal from Sprong off of a nice, we've seen this time and time again, Kane backhand pass in front, smart pass, quick, simple. It looked pretty unassuming, but it was the right play and uh, Sprong scored a, a apt power play goal, one that they needed. They got that power play at the start of the third and I thought they need to score here to get back in it. Yeah, time's a factor and all faith had been lost in the power play, so that was a huge relief in two ways. And then Michael Rasmussen tipped in a goal from Jake Wallman to tie it. That was a, that line, that Rasmussen cop fisher line has just been so fantastic. We've talked about it before, but great play by Rasmussen. He was rewarded there and the Red Wings tied the game. I actually should mention before we get talking about the rest of the third here in overtime, the Red Wings maybe did a little something to get themselves energized going into the third because at the end of the second period, there's a scrum at the end there where uh, I think if you look at the replay, maybe the Red Wings did some bouncing around after the whistle and it started a whole big mix up where, you know, everyone was in the thick of it. Everyone grabbed their guy. Raymond was going at Yulson all game, really. And what came out of it was a big mismatch and Debrinket once again dropping the gloves against Ian Cole. Noted goon. Noted goon Alex Debrinket using his new dad energy. Congratulations to the Debrinkets, by the way. They welcomed their second son, uh, Maverick. So congratulations to Archie on now being a big brother too. But yeah, Debrinket ended up with Cole. I credit to Cole, that like a much bigger guy. And I think Debrinket really held his own in that fight. But Cole, by the end of it, you know, he could have taken some shots that I think some other cheaper players in the league would have and Cole held back when he should have his veteran move there. Yeah, it's hockey's a violent sport, but the guys who understand the code abide by the code most of the time. And yeah, it's you gotta give credit where credit's due. Ian Cole could have absolutely turned Alex to bring it to dust by the end of that if he wanted to. Yeah. So into the third, again Detroit ties the game. Uh, another play I want to talk about is there is a essentially a pad save by line and the puck was sitting on his pad and the scrum was pushing it over the line. You know, if the puck had crossed the line, I don't know how it would have been called based on who pushed who into it and what sticks were involved and when the whistle went, but that puck was moving in general towards the net. But what happened was Mo Sider basically came superhero diving on top of the pile and it didn't look like he intentionally covered the puck with his glove or anything. I'm not saying that's what he did. And a few players got their sticks in behind and were pushing the puck back out of the net area but the very key thing that most sider did in there he blocked the camera he blocked the net cam and he blocked the overhead cam and i'm not saying he did it on purpose maybe he did maybe he didn't but if that puck crossed the line there is absolutely zero way possible that they could have called it a goal because the call on the ice was not a goal and there's no way you could have ever turned that over so purposefully or not smart play by most sider Mo Sider with the big, it's not illegal if I can't see it, energy. <laughs> Pretty much. He's a smart enough guy to make the play. Uh, at the end of the third period, I was actually kind of worried, though, because I think Dakota Joshua unfortunately made a smart move by engaging with Sider in a scrum at the end and got him tangled up where they both went down and they got coincidental minors heading into overtime. You take out Joshua for Sider, Vancouver is going to take that trade 10 times out of 10. Anyhow, Detroit headed into overtime, and then the gritty happened. First off, it was a, it passed by Raymond, I believe, to Wallman. Great play. Wallman out on the breakaway. He was impeded from behind, you know, fouled from behind, whatever you want to call it in the rule book. And the referee, because he is an absolute Chad, a thousand years good fortune to this guy, this is what all referees should do. He didn't call a cross check or a slash or whatever. He just called the damn penalty shot. A penalty shot in overtime is just, that is the best energy you can put into a hockey game. If the, if the penalty call is there and the penalty shot call is there, just call it. Always air towards a penalty shot. It is so much better. Even for the ref, you get paid a flat rate for the Sanchez game. So the more overtime you ref, you're just refing for free at that <laughs> point. So the penalty <laughs> shot, if that ends it sooner and your day's over sooner, just smart move. Good financial decision. It was, and he he essentially just cross-checked him from behind to stop. It was a smart cross-check by Hughes, but it was a cross-check that stopped Wallman from like making the, the player taking the shot properly. It was the right call. 
and Wallman goes up on the penalty shot in overtime. Smart shot. I think uh, a little bit of deception in there hid his shot in the placement until the very last second, especially with his body language, went right side on Casey DeSmith. And then <laughs> that celebration, man, hits the gritty, not even for the first time. The roof blew off the LCA. Not, well, as you mentioned before, not even the first time against DeSmith. Not even the first time <laughs> against this goalie. In late December of 2022, Detroit was down against another team, came back, won in overtime on a Jake Wallman OT winner, and he hit the gritty, and the goalie in net was Casey DeSmith. What are the <laughs> you odds? You can't make that up. That is, incre- that is hockey poetry in the stupidest, most fun way. There's going to be a moment where in the next game – I think it's later this week against Vancouver. DeSmith is just going to blocker him from the bench if he's backing up. <laughs> the hockey world's going to wonder why, and we can just put our hands up and go, we understand. In all honesty, though, I have heard before that the Pittsburgh Penguins' lead was four goals that game yeah. where Detroit came back. That was a big lead that they gave up. And after Wallman hit the gritty on them in their arena, they were not a fan of that. Like, he was in their heads Good thing that. they don't have Morgan Riley on their team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And as we're going to talk about later, you have to be very, very careful. And and Wallman specifically has to be very careful with these celebrations because hockey players are the toughest, just most, you know, man, tough energy imaginable in sports. So you can't hurt their feelings because <laughs> if you hurt their feelings, oh, man, you're in trouble. NHL players hold grudges. I think all professional athletes probably hold grudges. Damn, you you don't want to be dis. It first of all, this doesn't sound ridiculous, but you don't want to be disrespected, and I think that's the stupidest thing ever. Like you get mad that someone gritties on you, like that's <laughs> outrageous. But that's how it's interpreted, and professional athletes are proud people, and they hold on to stupid things like that. Well, Vancouver shouldn't have let him score an overtime penalty shot game winner. If Hughes wants to be a Norris defenseman, maybe you shouldn't uh, give him a penalty shot. But again, you're right, Brad. Like. First off, hockey needs more of this. Hockey needs more Jake Wallman grittying multiple times on the same goalie. His his celly game is best in the league. Hockey needs more Ridley Gregg winding up full bore clapper into an empty net from five feet away to revive the Battle of Ontario. Hockey needs more like pure hatred? Blood, blood boiling, your bones vibrating hatred. Like I'll put this on record now, just in case it happens when Vancouver and Detroit play again in a week or two. If that game is close, if it goes to overtime, if Vancouver scores the winner and someone on Vancouver does the gritty or some ridiculous over the top celebration, it will make my blood boil, but I will respect the hell out of it. Yeah, that would be something. That is, that is how you handle that situation. Nobody should go out and cross check Jake Wallman in the face. But if you score a big goal or someone like scores a goal and it's because Wallman blew coverage or they undressed him or whatever and they wanted to do a little garbage oh right next to him. Yeah. That is That's to what your th- point. Yes, a thousand percent yes. Wallman should handle it like a man and give it right back to him next chance he gets. That's how this should be handled. I, I would you know what I don't want to cheer for Red Wings loss, but stuff like that is entertaining. It is. Yeah. I hope he goes in and does it against Vancouver in their own barn. Now. Yeah, if and if Wallman gets the better of him, by all means. <laughs> yeah. What other TikTok dance do you want to bust though, Jake? Let's see it. I have faith. His when he came out for the the first star and the fans obviously cheered him hard. Hockey Town loves Jake Wallman, and then he gave the old uh, jersey tug, logo tug, Vlad Nemestikov style. Like that guy loves playing in Detroit. Detroit loves Jake Wallman in Hockey Town. He is. He makes hockey so fun. He's made the Red Wings so fun. This whole team is way better. And we're going to talk in a minute here about how they've been able to get the results. But so much of just the energy and the personality on this team is better. And Jake Wallman's a big part of that. That whole sequence, like coming down on the breakaway, getting penalized, getting the penalty shot, scoring, immediately hitting that celebration. The the lid blows off the place. Come back win after being off that many games. Firmly entrenching yourself in a playoff race where you control your own destiny against a top team in the league. That's scripted stuff. That is that is absolutely Detroit Red Wings are so back scripted stuff. Yeah, to take an absolutely stupid topic like this, but make it real in how it affects an NHL team. You know, anybody who's played hockey has been in a million locker rooms. And you know, if you have 
20 very stoic, very serious Jonathan Taze types in that room, you're going to be terrible. Nobody's going to be having any fun. It's going to feel like a job. It's going to feel like a nine to five. But the Red Wings have a good mix of those. And then they have the, you know, Jake Wallman with his big energy, Lucas Raymond, the ultimate little brother energy, Mo Sider and his goofy ass in there. You need guys like that. Like it keeps the room loose. It makes guys want to show up even on days where they know they might get bag skated or they're on an off day and they don't really want to practice stuff like that goes a long, long way. I, that has to be a big part of our next conversation here, which we already opened up a little bit. This is maybe why the Red Wings have been able to have the mentality to come back in game seven comeback wins. Yeah. It, it's like having a lot of hits, right? It means you don't have the puck a lot, or it means you're going into the third period uh, down a lot of games, but you know what? It's way better. It's way better than being down in the third period and just having the lead get worse and further away from you, which is what Detroit has been for how many years now. The top teams in the league find a way to come back, especially when they're losing. The NHL season is long. You play 82 games. No one's going to be leading every single game. You're going to have nights where you're playing like absolute garbage. You're going to have nights where you have a major power play that you do nothing on. And what you do to get back from that is what separates actual serious playoff contenders from the duds like the senators this year or buffalo or teams that you know think they should be better but don't have the mentality detroit has the mentality this year they are the perfect embodiment of they don't ask how they ask how many this season because again they're a flawed team they're not perfect i I think i think they lack a lot of consistency we've talked a lot about their defense blah 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 it doesn't matter because when you get to the standings detroit is still in a wild card playoff spot by points percentage, they're better than Tampa Bay, who's in the third divisional seed. Toronto is too, and they're ahead of Detroit, but I digress. Just win is their motto this year, and they have been they have been embodying that to a T. We've seen a ton of analytics this year, a lot that shows, yeah, okay, maybe the Red Wings aren't this good, and a lot of analytics go, here's where they're thriving. But I got to tell you, vibes per 60, number one in the league. When guys care about each other and they're – coming together under one goal like the Red Wings are like they they know they're not the most talented team in the NHL they know that they're gonna have to work a lot harder than some of the star-studded teams do to get wins like that galvanizes a group and you can tell what the Red Wings they never get down on themselves they always you know try to stick to the game plan and, and get back into games and they have And as, you know, Derek Lalonde is doing this and building this culture in Detroit, as Steve Eisenman adds more high-end talent to this team, and not like it's going to make the the wins come easier overnight, but it's way better to bring talent into a locker room that has already figured it out or is on their way to figuring it out than trying to add talent overnight to a room that's disjointed and has no cohesion and there's no glue in the room and, you know, there's no celebration that leaves the guys feeling like how Evan feels right now on the podcast. So it is a... It is a great vibe in hockey town right now. Speaking of great vibes, Rasmussen, Cop, Fisher, uh, Prashanth wrote in our group chat, and I want to to read this stat out that he pulled up. Cop, Rasmussen, and Fisher have now played approximately 140 minutes at five on five without allowing a goal. Only two lines in the NHL have played more than 100 minutes without allowing a goal at five on five. That line and Eberle, Benier, Sitar in Seattle. It is not just that Copper, Rasmussen, and Fisher have found some gel and they're doing well by Detroit standards. They are like the toughest or one of the toughest lines to play against in the league right now. We talked about it at the beginning of the year, the Red Wings. This wasn't the three players in particular we thought that would gel together, but the Red Wings formula for success because of their, we'll call it lack of scoring depth, would have to incorporate some sort of elite shutdown line so you can open up some more favorable matchups to maybe, you know, your second line, which isn't going to hold up well against other teams' second lines. But if you can deploy the Rasmussen line to take that matchup and then the second line can see some more third and fourth lines, hey, all of a sudden you got a chance here. And they have done literally exactly that as well as could possibly be expected. I think they're doing it. Yeah, Prashant said they're doing it at 51% five on five expected goals four percentage too. So look, it is, and he used the word suffocating to play against. Well, yeah. they're hard on pucks. They're big guys. They play hard down low and they force 
players out wide, and that is like the worst thing ever to play against. Guys who just are relentless against you, it's brutal. So this line's been clicking, and you know they may not have the star talent, but man, do they! They're lunch pail guys. They they clock in and they put in work, and then they clock out, and it's crazy to see how good this line's been. You make a great point there, Evan, and there's probably a longer conversation to be had on a future episode, but how they keep the high danger chances away uh, from in front of Alex Lyon or whoever's in net, and they make teams work for strong opportunities and, you know, force them to the perimeter. That is a big part of the formula. Credit to them. I think we've seen before in Rasmussen's career how much better the Red Wings are when they find a spot for him where he can excel. And it's not just that. Fisher, I think, has done what he's been asked to do since being brought in. I really like him. He's a heart and soul guy. But yeah, finding a way to reclaim cop season mid-season, is, that is no small task and that is no small impact. So credit to the players and also to, to the Red Wings coaching staff. So the Red Wings find themselves in a playoff spot right now. They are in the second wild card spot, 60 points in 51 games. Uh, right behind them are the Devils and the Islanders, as well as the Penguins and the Capitals, uh, but no one really is right at Detroit's 588 points percentage. Toronto's in the first wild card spot, same amount of points, just one game in hand on Detroit has a 600 points percentage at the time of recording. They're both looking at Tampa Bay in the third a divisional seed in the Atlantic who have a 575 points percentage, 61 points in 53 games. So Detroit in the mix here. They're looking at either one of the wild card spots or, I mean, if Morgan Riley has gone for a long time and in Tampa Bay, they were now without Sergachev for a long time with that was a nasty play. Detroit has an opportunity here. I'd love to keep talking about playoff chances, but I really want to talk about a full wind-up clapper into an empty net and then bedlam after. What happened in Toronto and Ottawa at the end of the game? Brad, you're right. That's just rock star energy. Ridley Gregg, the Red Wings fans needed Ottawa to get the win here because now every Toronto loss helps Detroit's playoff percentages. Uh, Ottawa's not in the mix. As much as they have Detroit's number, they're not a playoff team this year. And so Red Wings fans had to cheer for Ottawa, maybe a begrudgingly. And... Not only did Ottawa deliver, they delivered in ways we didn't even think was imaginable. Oh, this was phenomenal in so many ways at one, exposing the Leafs and two, exposing hockey culture in general and three, exposing Leafs culture specifically because the layers to the meltdown from Toronto on this one, obviously Ottawa, Toronto, huge rivals have been forever. It's you know, I, I wish no success for either of them, but when both those teams are good and meeting in the playoffs, it is some of the best hockey we've seen in the last 20 years. It's a shame it hasn't happened in the last, like, 15 years. But Ottawa is upsetting Toronto. It's a huge moment for them. They know this game matters to Toronto. They're up 4-3. Ridley Gregg makes a good defensive play, gets the breakaway. He knows a thousand percent what he's doing there. I love this. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. He... A thousand percent knows what he's doing. He is earning his badge as like the one of the new super pests in the league. And, you know, I've talked at length about the role, how much I can respect the guys who lean into it. A heel who's like an entertaining heel. Yeah, exactly. Big Brad Marchand energy. Like I'm going to be an a-hole. I'm going to own up to it and I'm going to love every second of it. And he winds up and just fires a piss missile from the top of the crease into the net. Now. This is where the nuance of it comes in. If I'm the Ottawa Senators and I'm upsetting the Toronto Maple Leafs and I'm firing into that empty net, oh, I get it. I would do the same thing. Yeah. Huge, huge energy. Like, love it, love it, love it. But we, everybody who's going to do that understands. I'm going to get punched in the face when I do this, but it's worth it. Someone so, asked the question. They're like, did he, is that actually considered like a no-no? It's like, yeah, yeah, that's a big th- This is like, if you're a baseball fan, this is bat flipping in the ninth inning when you're up by seven. Like, <laughs> what you should also do because yeah, that's funny. That is hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious bullshit. And like, there's five seconds left. He knows he's ending the game here. Morgan Riley's the closest on scene. Now, if I put myself in Toronto's shoes, if I put myself in Morgan Riley's shoes and I see a guy doing that. I'm going to go over there and have some words. Yeah, for sure. I am going to get my we'll call it pound of flesh like he knows he's about to get punched in the face i will be very happy to be the guy to deliver that so are leave fans right for saying he was showboating and he deserved something 
A hundred percent. Are Ottawa fans right for saying it's rock star shit? What do you want them to do? A hundred percent. The only there's two things that went wrong on this play from Toronto standpoint. One, you don't cross check him in the face. Yeah, you know, like Leaf fans are defending this by saying, "What? Oh, what? You didn't want us to do anything? No, we all wanted you to retaliate." As soon as everybody saw him wind up, we're like, "Yes." Was this? Was it Mark Hunter who ran over Pierre Turgeon back in Dale the Dale Hunter. Was it Dale Hunter? Dale that Hunter. Uh, You know, I got shades of that a little <laughs> yeah. bit. Dude, uh, he, Riley domed him so good. I saw the one angle, I went, oh my God. And I saw another angle, I'm like, oh my God. That was, it was worse from the second angle. They they said Greg was I'm uh, surprised diving. some Ottawa fans weren't just jumping on the ice. I was like, how is that a dive? I'd be dead. Yeah, it exploded his jaw and... So that was the first thing the Leafs did wrong. The part of this all that doesn't get talked about enough. And again, it's so fun to rip on the Leafs for this, especially on a day where we saw Alex DeBrinkett fighting, what, six foot three Ian Cole or however big he is. Do you notice when the full line brawl happened? What didn't happen? Did you nobody not notice what happened when Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner got in there? Oh, God, nothing. They just stayed on the outside of it. Tarasenko even at one point like gave Matthews a good shot. Like, are we doing this? And Matthews was just like, nah. Yeah, that's Matthews to a T. It's, oh, man. it's big leaf energy. Riley, credit to him for being the guy to step up. Absolutely no credit to him for doing it like a little bitch. And then you get your superstars in there who don't want any part of it after getting embarrassed by a basement feeder in the NHL in a game that you definitely should have won. And then you get to the press conference after and Sheldon Keefe giving his, I thought it was appropriate. I think that's the only thing he could have said, though. That guy is in, in full, I don't care what you do with me because I know yeah, I'm about to be yeah. fired mode. And if that's the only way he can get this team who is not performing this year fired up, who cares? Like, it is his job to be on the player's side because that is his only tether to keeping his job right now. Yeah, it, I, He's he a meathead, but he's he, right. His sentiment is right. He could have worded it better. Like, maybe a cross-check to the head's not appropriate. No, no, but yeah. no. He, even though he knows he might objectively wrong, I think he did the right thing by lying through his teeth and backing <laughs> his guy 100%. Yeah, so the entire situation is hilarious to me. I fully understand why why Ottawa did what they did and why Ridley Gregg did what he did, and I love it and I respect it. I understand the Leafs feeling the way they did. That's how they should feel in that scenario, and they reacted accordingly. The only thing that was truly wrong about this situation was a cross-check to the head. And it's funny watching the discourse on Twitter because Ottawa and Toronto might be the two most insufferable fan bases on Twitter. So this, of course, went as well as you could expect. And it was just, again, that... Jim from the office looking through the shades is the perfect <laughs> analogy on this one <laughs> because it was either he should have hit him or he shouldn't have done anything. He did nothing wrong. And it's like, guys, everybody's right. It just shouldn't have been a cross check. That's the whole thing. Yeah. I have all the time in the world to have this conversation. Oh, that's because the only reason you showed up today. I have all the time in the world to listen to Leaf fans melting down, you know, call me woke, but I'm not a big use your stick as a weapon guy, but every other part. <laughs> of that play I thought was hilarious and great. Like I, I think Greg played it off. Like he, the way he was skating along the boards, he was essentially goading something to happen. I think he, he didn't probably strike the right balance of like playing it off and letting uh, Riley get a little bit more of him and maybe not expecting that Riley would, Go insane and hit him with. He probably should have. Yeah, he just look over a little earlier. Definitely should have looked for his dance partner uh, preemptively because I think the storm was coming, but probably didn't expect a cross check right to the teeth. I think the Senators did a bad job of getting around and getting Riley. I honestly think what should happen, in, in all seriousness, here is that the next game they should do the exact same thing again and just <laughs> run it back, just full clap and goalie and net, no goalie and net. I don't care, run it back. Well, this is you know we're talking about the Red Wings about how they've galvanized around a cause and they've realized they don't have like the a superstar team that's going to be first in the standings. And you look at Toronto. Toronto is you know I don't want to say that they're a team that's kind of you know just drifting in the wind, but oh I will they. I think, okay, so if you're a Boomer fan and you see Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner not getting involved, that drives you off the wall because it it shouldn't matter who you are or what your role is on the team. you got to back your guy up. And mm -hmm. when you're 
anybody on your team. I think it would look better if those guys got in there and like if a 70 goal scorer can get in there, everybody else can too. And imagine they had Lucas Raymond's tenacity. Yeah. Well, uh, look at the top guys. Even if you're not a t- even if you don't want to do it, you just got to do it. We've talked about the Red Wings' tenacity this year and the comebacks and the we're just going to do whatever we can to win, even if we're probably not as good a team as our record stands. Who's always in the middle of this shit for the Red Wings? We've pissed and moaned for years about it shouldn't always be these guys, but Larkin, Raymond, debrinkett has got two fights this year. The stars, the leaders of the Red Wings— Get into the shit. You can say what you want about the Tampa Bay Lightning and Nikita Kucherov being the asshole that he is. He's always in the middle of it. You look at the truly elite teams in the league. Their top guys do not screw around. Who might be the most important player to the Bruins? Brad Marchand. In the middle of everything. We've seen it this year a million times, even against Detroit. David Pasternak's got a bit of a mean streak to him, and you would never guess it, but he'll get into it when the time calls. Remember, it was him and Wallman were getting into it the game we were at. Nikita Kucherov for Tampa Bay is one of the nastiest players to play against. Yeah, and if anybody wants to talk about the missing pieces in Toronto, it's overly simplistic to say, but that might be it. Their big guys are not leaders. They're just there to do their job and go home. They don't have the, ironically, they don't have the passion. (laughs) (laughs) Look, from a new, you're, you guys are but right. then the, and then they trot out Ryan Reeves and you're like this is the biggest joke of all time. It's just like it's all theater to me when you watch the Toronto Maple Leafs. You see these people who who win awards and they're you know Mitch Marner and Austin Matthew are two of the best players in the league. Full stop. But then you see stuff like that and it's like, man, what I would I would just kill to have that talent and someone who's gets into the shit yeah like i just it, it it would drive me nuts as a leaf fan but since we're not i love every second of it <laughs> well i'll give credit where credit is due one of the best quotes i saw on this exact topic after the game last night was steve in his lfr video after where he just went around and said basically what you said when you brought reads it's all lip service they say all the right shit after the games but when the moment arrives they disappear. It's, it's just, just decoration, just, yeah. It's just lip service. And yeah. Austin Matthews is a big dude. Like, if he just pumps some guy's eyes shut one night, everybody like, all right, we're 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 locked in now. Like, yeah. this, this guy is all in and is wants to win this. But time and time again, you, you see them just not be engaged. And, you know, maybe I'm just an old boomer who loves violence, which is all very true. <laughs> but, you know, that just sends a bad message to to guys when you see other guys backing off. You know what? I will say for the Leafs, if what Morgan Riley did is the first thing that gets them going and helps them understand what they then need to... Then it was money well spent. And he's going to spend a lot of money on this because the Department of Player Safety took their time, I think, relative to the Zadorov ruling, for example. But they came out and it came out that they were deliberating, deliberating whether to offer him an in-person or a phone hearing. And a phone hearing means he could have a maximum of five games Suspension and in-person hearing offered means they can suspend him for six or more. Not guaranteed, but they could. And then he could appeal. We know how it all went with Perron and everything. But they offered him an in-person hearing. So six or more games is on the table. And now you're drawing the comparison to the Perron incident. And what are they going to give him? I predicted it would be phone hearing five games to prevent the he- the appeal. But they might be going higher here. The one thing we should bring up first here and the NHL department of player safety is awful in so many ways. But the one thing where I'd say they're generally pretty consistent is they do go off of precedent. Now in 98% of occurrences, their precedent is way too damn low, but they stick to it. And we saw that with the Zadorov suspension yesterday, the one-to-one comparison to uh, Perron's incident and Riley's incident is really damn close. So six games is what Perron got. So that would be my prediction for what Riley got because they were both cross checks directly to the face after the play had ended. The only real difference was when Perron did it, he was watching Artem Zub standing over Dylan Larkin's unconscious body. It wasn't Zub. We've established that it was entirely wrong and thus the suspension Morgan Riley did it because he got his feelings hurt. So 
if we're factoring in motivations here, you could maybe make the argument Riley should be a touch longer, but based on the actual act, it's the same thing. So it should be the same suspension. Yeah, I want another Zapruder film on the amount of strides that he took like they did with Perron. That was insane. What a wild night in the NHL. Oh, it's so funny, man. It and, is so And funny. I was uh, in Alora, and they had it on the jumbo – or the projector, and there's – I think everyone in Alora is a Leaf fan. And so when that happened, the place was going wild. I thought, <laughs> I thought there was going to be cross checks to the face in the bar. It was going wild. Look, man, hockey is better when the – Blood feud rivalries are there, and the Battle of Ontario was one of them. Toronto and Ottawa fans. Red Wings fans know full well how antagonistic Ottawa fans can be, and Red Wings fans know full well that there's no better team in the NHL to hate than the Toronto Maple Leafs. So Toronto-Ottawa, like that is just the – it's one of the most perfect situations to have it boil over in a way that's entertaining for everyone else toronto montreal is in there too but toronto ottawa is just the atlantic could turn into a bloodbath if like ottawa gets their act together toronto gets their act together montreal gets their act together the whole 401 there could just be filled with blood (laughs) yes it's gonna be bad I, I think we referenced it in the offseason, but it looks like it could come true where John Cooper brought up a point years ago. He's like, there's going to be a point in this division where the Bruins, the Lightning, the Leafs start regressing and the Wings, the Senators, the Sabres, the Montreal will be on the up and up and the whole division will be really damn close to parody and it will turn into just this absolute Thunderdome of chaos. If you look at it right now, we're, it's getting very close to that point. Not the eclipse has away. not happened, but it's uh, it's starting for sure. Like if the re- Leafs regress closer to the Senators level and Montreal creeps up a little bit and Detroit gets closer to some of these levels, we've seen the hatred Detroit and Tampa have. Detroit and Ottawa, Toronto and Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal, Boston and everybody. If <laughs> If they're all playing games against each other that have heavy standings implication where – you know, tensions are high. We didn't even mention Nick Cousins still exists in this division as yeah, well. This this could get to be a very regular occurrence in these games. I thought I had fun yesterday watching the Red Wings game, man, but my I was my smile persisted through the entire evening. <laughs> oh, what a God. wild day of hockey. I have a we'll move on here, but I have a Sens fan friend who messaged me and obviously like he's in the the thick of the emotions literally as it was happening he's like what do you think about this and i told him i was like man this is so funny and i told him i was like he had to have expected something i don't think that was the right thing to do but all in all very funny and something else i said to him i was like if you're a sense fan like i understand why you're pissed but hey at least they got the right guy this time (laughs) perron got zub and zub had nothing to do with it and he was like it wasn't the right guy he shouldn't have done it i'm like no no no, i know but at least he didn't go over and like do it to Tarasenko or something. At least he, he got the guy who took the clapper. So, you know, if you're a Sens fan and you're saying, wow, I wish my guys would stop taking cross checks to the head, that's very fair. But it is slowly getting less bad. Unfortunately, <laughs> I just looked at the Leafs schedule. They don't play Ottawa again this year. Oh, devastating. That's devastating. I'm very sad about that. Well, their memories are long, especially when it comes to Canadian hockey fan bases in teams so if the Leafs have another if someone has an empty net against the Leafs they have to take a slap shot it's for the culture they you have, have to, to do it for the culture it. it's this league wide conspiracy theory if they take enough clappers onto empty nets there'll be enough Leaf suspensions that it takes them out of the playoff race look man I'm all for it all right let's jump back into the world of the Red Wings before overtime here the Grand Rapids Griffins, you know, when we were there in Grand Rapids, we had the live show. We were talking to Dan Watson. We were talking to Matt Luff, and we were talking to the, the fans and listeners there. The Griffins have really turned things around this season. Uh, they had a, they're had a they on a 12-2-2 stretch right now, dating back to December 27th. I think Tom Mitzos, it was, yes, who wrote in, uh, a piece about how on December 27th, they were sixth in the Central Division, and they, now they're in second place. They are... For the first time, like this isn't the first time we're saying this. We've said this before, but they are really coming together as a team that has a lot of talent, but is figuring out how to translate that not into just, oh, these guys could be Red Wings prospects, but Dan Watson has brought the Griffins to a place where they're actually converting in the AHL and they are now in the thick of it as a, you know, playoff team and a team who could make a push here. Like what a run by them. 
yeah, we've, you know, pointed out that you don't win in the AHL with a predominantly young team. And the Griffins are a very young team, but they're winning. Again, I could understand why people are very mad that Berggren and Edmondson aren't in the NHL. And they should be. And they obviously should be. And we know the Red Wings have some depth scoring issues. We know their depth defensive issues. And you could easily plug Berggren and Edmondson there and not lose a beat. You probably actually gain. But the Red Wings are winning. And the Griffins are winning. This could be a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Because Berggren and Edmondson leading a playoff charge and maybe winning a playoff round or two. There's a lot of value in that in the AHL level. And yes, we still have the conundrum of when do you bring these guys up? Cause you can't bring up nine rookies at the same time. I understand that it's not a perfect argument. And again, I'm just presenting the other side cause I still think they should be up, but this is huge. Yeah. This is a team. It's not like Edvinson and Johansson and Casper and Mazer and Berggren are there and they are learning what winning feels like. We saw firsthand, these are the guys leading the team. These are the guys dragging them to this 12-2-2 and two run. Kosa in the new year, phenomenal. Mm-hmm. He's been their best goalie. Great podcast appearance, too. Yeah. This is exactly, exactly what you want to see your AHL team doing. Because not only are the players getting better, the prospects are getting better. They're learning what it feels like to play a full season. They're learning what it feels like to succeed. And they're learning what it feels like to be the leaders of that success. We talk about tangibles and intangibles and how they translate into the NHL. They're getting all of it right now. You you made a really good point there. Like, yeah, I think Berggren is an NHL player. But with how things are going right now, even though I agree I would like to see him in the NHL, it's almost gotten so far to the point where this guy is so like too good for this league where I don't think they're losing a lot. Like if they're trying to showcase him for a potential trade, I think they're doing just as good by leaving him in the AHL and the energy around the Griffins right now has been getting better and better and better every game. It's palpable in that arena. If you go there, which we highly recommend you do. Yeah, I think you're right. I think this could benefit them a lot. And if what they're trying to instill in Bear Grin is like, the mentality of constantly bringing this game and having an edge and always playing full bore. Like he had a, it's not just the six shootout goal that he scored against the Manitoba Moose. It's the, the diving overtime save uh, a defensive play the next game, the lead up to that, notwithstanding, but having him be one of the more dominant players on the ice to help bring that out in his game. If you left it up to me, would he be, he be up right now? Yes, but I do think this is a roundabout way of of still getting that benefit. And Edvinson is having a, a strong playoff push and and having that kind of winning culture and understanding what it's like to be a team that comes together. I'll I'll eat crow on this one. I would have thought that it was a big, big mistake to not bring him up or at least both of them up sooner. But this is a really good situation that they're in. I think what we obviously don't hear is the communication and what the expectations are for those players. Like, you know, maybe the messaging is to Berggren and, and Edvinson that, you know, you guys are going to be the guys. We want you to be in Grand Rapids and we want you to dominate that league and be the guys. And that's your goal for this year. And if that is it, then I think, you know, mission is closing on on being successful. But I like them down there right now. I want to see those guys dominate. I don't want them to come into Detroit and play a handful of minutes a night. I'd way rather them just blow the AHL up and dominate it and be the guys down there and and lead a team because eventually the Red Wings are going to need leaders to carry them through the playoffs too. And if they've done that at the AHL level, I I think it'll be a very nice transition. It's... Like, it, it's not a perfect comparison, but if the Red Wings lost Raymond, for example, after the Zadorov hit for an extended period of time and a bunch of defensemen and maybe someone else in the top six, then you can start to say, okay, you have to make the tough decision. Do you sacrifice AHL success to make sure you don't lose your playoff push here? Yeah, but as of right now, yeah, I think you guys both make a good point. They're they're in a good position. Also, credit to to Lombardi. scored a six shootout goal as well in the, the first win against the Moose. They lost the next day in overtime. Uh, but Lombardi scored a sweet shootout goal and Casper scored from between his legs in that game too. That was hilarious to watch. 
Skill plays for Marco Casper. Exactly what we want to see. It a hundred percent yes. And Casper has. We've talked about it before. He has had a really strong kind of coming on this season where he's been able to pull his game together. So that was a good stretch here. 12, two and two. And and they're right there at the top of the division. Good for the Griffins. Good for Dan Watson and good for the Red Wings organization. The vibes are high right now. Very high. Uh, Speaking of high vibes, just a quick note here. Some, some folks have been pointing to some Emmett Finney highlights. He is a seventh round pick of Detroit's a recent seventh round pick. He plays out in uh, Cam Loops in the WHL. Uh, checked in on him. He's a point per game right now in the WHL uh, on an 11 game point streak, a seven goal week for him. So uh, Brad, you mentioned he's like at his age, you would expect him to be dominating or you would hope that he'd be dominating the WHL. So this is in line with, you know, what you would think for a guy who's, this is his third season there, but nevertheless, good to see for a late, late round flyer for Detroit. Yeah. Expectations here are very low. Very low, but he's at least exceeding them to some degree. Okay. Uh, The Red Wings, we didn't talk about their upcoming schedule, but they are about to head on a little West Coast road trip here, which is going to be an important one because uh, it's not going to be easy. They have Edmonton on Tuesday. Edmonton's not on that crazy winning streak anymore, but they, it's still the Edmonton Oilers. And they have Vancouver on Thursday, which will be (laughs) a fun fun little redo. Hey, Zadorov will be back for that game. I think that's his first game back, right? Fun. <laughs> the Red Wings are pissed off about the hit, so I imagine that game is going to be even more chipping than this one, and then they have Calgary and Seattle all on the road. So we'll be back with you on Wednesday, or we'll be back with you on Thursday, I should say, because we're taking Wednesday uh, for Valentine's Day so our wives don't hate us. Uh, but in that episode, Hate us be, less. Hate us less, that's right. And the episode will be coming out uh, before the Canucks game that's on Thursday night. All right, let's jump into overtime here. Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. If you want to support the show, you get a lot of great benefits like access to our overtime bonus episodes, which record right after these main ones. You get access to our Patreon exclusive discord. Also, we give away two tickets to every Detroit Red Wings home game. Uh, the vast majority of them going directly to our Patreon supporters. So again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. If you want to support the show. All right, let's take some questions here from our patrons. The Jims says, hey, boys, haven't posted in a while, but want to say how great all the shows have been. Helps the wings have been on fire. Thank you, the Jims. Uh, He says, my question is, what do you think the odds that Wallman will get another contract with Detroit is? Of course, I'm biased with my autographed Wallman jersey, and I have to say he was even cooler in person than I could have imagined. Well, I'm going to say they're very high. He's on the number one pair with Mo Sider, and we've talked about their usage, and He's what, like top five in defenseman goals right now? Yeah, I think it's safe to say he's probably getting another contract. Obviously, it's still two years left after this one. It's hockey. million things could happen, but I I would say it's likely. The vibes are as high as they could possibly be right now. Give Walman the heart says, hearing Mazer and Kosa gush about Albert Johansson got me thinking about our crowded blue line and the need to stagger prospects again. And I've come to an opinion that may be unpopular, but I think warrants some debate. The Red Wings should trade Goss's spare at the deadline no matter where they are in the playoff race. I think his reputation is at an all-time high based off the start to the season, but he hasn't been consistently good defensively, at least not to the point where I think we would extend him. Get a decent return, bring up Edvinson permanently, and hopefully Johansson steals a spot in camp next season. There have been a bunch of opportunities for them to bring Edvinson up this year, and they haven't. So I've resigned myself to believe it's not going to happen this year, at least not for anything more than spot duty. I think I'm at the point right now where the best scenario is you have Edvinson. Uh, maybe, maybe Johansson outplays him in training camp, but I'll say Edvinson start the year with Detroit next year. And it's already crowded blue line. So let's assume Johansson starts in the AHL. You bring Johansson up around New Year's in a perfect scenario. It's not a one-to-one, and then you do have two rookies in the back half of the season, but at least you're getting Edmondson 40 games experience before you bring in another rookie, maybe something along those lines, because, again, fives are high in Detroit. They're winning games. Their bottom four defensemen are still a huge, huge problem, so... Gosses Bears fifth in the team in total points and plays almost 20 minutes a night. You can't just no. trade a guy like that. Exactly. Gosses Bears not going anywhere this year. You know, 
Grand Rapids heater be damned. I'm still in the camp of you get Edmondson up right now if you can. Again, I think the opportunities have been there, so I don't think it's happening. Yeah, you have to stagger them. The one argument I would have would res- revolve around how far away you think Axel Sandin Pelica is. If you think he's still two years away after this season, it's probably not that big a deal because they don't have many other NHL-worthy defensemen coming up. Yeah, outside chance will linder and Booyam still could become something. But really, you're looking at, in all likelihood, Edmondson, Johansson, and Sandine Pelica. The likely scenario is they're already in the next year and a half. You know, Sandine Pelica probably not next year, but good chance the year after. So there is going to be a huge issue of how you stagger this. I'm going to fade my answer into the another question here from Upernadian. It says, things are looking good for the playoffs right now, but I'm still concerned about the lapses that cause good performances to be not so good. Anything on the rumor mill about possible improvements on the blue line? Cheers. So that feeds into my answer, which is, you know, Eiserman is a pretty active guy when it comes to, like, we know that he calls uh, about improving the team a lot. That's going to be any GM where your team needs to improve. It, that's not a novel concept. There have been some rumors about trying to improve the blue line, and that's not also a novel concept because Detroit's blue line, as Brad just alluded to, beyond a few players, sucks. Like, it's not been good. And it's been really hampering Detroit from being an even better team. But the fact remains is that you need to find a balance of not pulling the rug out from beneath what they're doing this season. And you also don't want to do things in terms of acquisitions that are going to be just rentals. So if there's a possibility to improve the team for one, two, three seasons beyond this one, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that Eisenman will will consider a little bit longer. But the problem with those kinds of trades is they're convoluted, they're more rare, and they're not really in the public eye at around trade deadline in terms of guys who could be moved. So, you know, the Chikrin conversation, for example. And he's just the face of that. He's not the only one that's going to be a hard piece to pry away for a lot of different reasons, but you go for the tougher stuff right now and you, you mix up less of this unit unless it's like an absolute improvement for very little cost. It's a problem. Like how do they stagger in these prospects? It's a problem, but it is also a good problem because if you, if you can hang on for dear life at the blue line for long enough, then your, your depth is almost resolved if you're able to factor in, you know, those three prospects that you mentioned reasonably well, that's a big ask, I admit, but you replace, you know, pick your three least favorite Red Wings defensemen with Sandy and Pelika, Edvinson, Johansson in some kind of middle to depth capacities over the next short to medium term. I think I'm less concerned with, with that than what, what they have the now. status quo is. Yeah. Also, there's the one point we haven't mentioned yet, which is, we keep saying over and over again, the Red Wings are still one to two big pieces away, like star level players away from being an actual cup contender. We know that's not coming in free agency where they're picking in the draft. We know it's not likely coming from there, which leaves trade teams value defense. And you're going to need some premium pieces to get these guys. So having three of Axel, Cindy and Pelica, Johansson and Edmondson right there. There's a very strong possibility one of them makes their NHL debut in the next two years, and it's not for Detroit. Well, Lender's going to be in that conversation as well. Yeah. Like, obviously not as premier of a prospect, but he'll be there too. And that's a really great point. It's not just that not all prospects pan out. I think uh, shrewd GMs utilize prospects who think don't necessarily have a future or they can get more for them by trading them. Yeah, it, I'm not saying this is true, but if you're Steve Eisenman and you're going, wow, Albert Johansson is having a great year at the AHL level, but you look at his toolkit and you're like, ah, six-foot defenseman who's not like an elite skater, I don't see it in the NHL. Maybe you sell high. Maybe this is the time. It's like, all right, we're going to use him this summer to boost the value and maybe that saves us from having to trade an Edmondson or a Casper to get, again, he's not getting traded, but someone like a Cal Connor. You're good. You're not getting a premium piece like that without giving up something that's going to make you really sad. All right. Last question here. 
Uh, Kevin Wolf says three separate five-minute major plus game misconducts on one day. All three were different kinds of plays. The Department of Player Safety has clearly lost the room, so to speak. The players don't respect each other or the code, and they don't fear the punishment. Same question as the opening scene of Shorzy. In your opinion, what's the dirtiest play in hockey? Dirtiest play in hockey? Oh, man, like... Anything with your stick. For me... It's reckless. It's unwarranted. There's no, there's no instance where using your stick as a weapon is okay in my books. I this is going to come as a surprise to nobody. It's headshots for me. It's we we know what happens to the brain when you get enough of those. If I had to, yeah, you end up recording a podcast twice a week. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. If I had to circle a highlight, a play to really. Because, I mean, there's a million types of headshots and they don't all fall in the same category. What Gallagher did to Pellick, that exactly, that's it for me. That's yeah, the that dirty. When there's malicious hockey. intent like yeah. that, regardless of the yeah. act, I think it's really bad. Yeah, like Zadorov, I classify as reckless, not malicious. Gallagher's was malicious. Uh, I'm I'm really, Slewfoot's drive me up the wall, like, those could be so ugly. And I'm not, I don't just mean like break your tailbone, break an arm or a wrist. I mean, like someone gets slew footed at the wrong time. Their head hits the ice. You could be, uh, that could be like tragic. One time someone in beer league tried to slew foot me and I like was so pissed off. He, and I was playing defense at the time. He literally got a suicide pass 10 seconds later. I lit him up (laughs) so hard, like shoulder to like the top of his rib cage and he was looking up at the ice <laughs> so fast. It felt amazing. I only got a two-minute penalty, so it was Oh, that's it. good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another one I'll add in there. This isn't the dirtiest play, but one where I think there's not even like, a, oh, I'm a cheap player. I'm just going to piss him off. Like, I don't think there's any room for it in the game is nut taps. Like, yeah. it just don't, don't oh, stick the old cup a check, Oh, eh? my. It drives me insane, dude. Like, I, I have zero respect for that. I, I've got one more I'm going to add just because I want to add to Evan's phenomenal beer league stories. It's... One, beer league hardos are my biggest pet peeve. If you're out there throwing hits that yeah, aren't, who would do that? <laughs> that, <laughs> aren't, <laughs> that aren't retaliatory. Like we all have to work tomorrow. Like what the hell are you doing? Uh, hit from behind. Yeah. And we had one. There's been a lot in the NHL this yeah. year. And we had one in a beer league game, like two seconds left. To, to this day, it's one of the cheapest things I've ever seen in a beer league. A guy full on cross check low back from behind two feet away from the boards two seconds left in a beer league game would austin matthews stand up for him though i was the closest guy on scene and of oh, course so it was a guy with a full cage <laughs> i grabbed him from behind i just grabbed his cage and he must not have had his helmet on very tight cuz i got that off shockingly fast yeah and just McKinnon to Garland, I didn't throw it at him, but I just chucked it across the ice should have thrown it at him and when he turned around the fear of god he had in his eyes that, oh, no. And then I got him on the ice, and it was like the scene out of a movie. I was ready to take my five-game suspension for that. Brad's undoing doing his skate to stab him. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Literally, I have him grabbed by the collar, arms You're cocked You're doing back, your Dare McCarty impression. And, and two of their guys just, like, steam, like, ta- football tackle me. They're like, hey, that guy. child is beating up our teammate. <laughs> yeah. It was like looking back at it, like I went from zero to a hundred on the anger scale because yeah. of how dirty the play was. But looking back on it, it's one of the, had to have been the funniest beer league sequence I've ever been Those a part of. Refs, so I go, oh, God, yeah. here we go. <laughs> They're I'm getting paid days. 20 bucks an hour. Like, yeah. The, the five foot nine guy with like four career penalty minutes is just on top of a guy of beer league and just some guy Goldberg spears him off the top of his teammate. <laughs> All right. I've well, got, I've got an ad, uh, another an additional story, similar vein, but I'll save it for the for the, the overtime. The overtime, yeah. The the bonus overtime episodes is where we not only answer all of our other questions, but where we uh, incriminate ourselves even more. So tune into that. We're gonna uh, wrap up this episode so we can record that, and then also I might be able to edit and still catch the football game. Uh, but for now, thank you all so much for tuning into this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Fun time. These episodes are easy when hockey is this much Very fun. Very easy. But uh, appreciate all of you tuning in. If you're a new listener, welcome to the show. And if you're a listener of old, this is pretty cool to watch Detroit and Grand Rapids do what they're doing now. Uh, I'd like to shout out Labatt Blue Light for sponsoring the show and to all of our Patreon supporters for really making us be able to uh, you know, host Winged Wheel podcast nights. 
we don't make a buck off of those. Uh, it, it costs us to host them. And so uh, for us to be able to do that and support the Jamie Daniels Foundation, it's not us doing it. It's our Patreon supporters. To all our name level supporters on Patreon, Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, Samuel Soderholm, Icon, Brad's Lord and Savior, Bradley Cleveland, Glenn Brabham, Croner's Left Knee, Ashley Van Conet, Sea Lion, Matthew M. Rice, Admiral Matt S. of the Cheesebag Navy, Carl, Brutina Nenaluski, Carl Provi, Citizen High Five, Clip Clop Nene, Connor Scovey, Craig Kibble, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Eric Shun, G.O.D. Creatives, Give Blood Fight Probert, Help Me Obtain a Toaster's Jersey, Please, Hockey Town Love, Hockey Town Matt, Hassam Al Qasem, I'm Ryan, Nine Year Hannah, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Jonathan Miller, Kaylin Wood, Marcus, Marlon Winchester, Matt K, Cannon Fodder to the Cheesebag Army, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, R.A., Red Feather Desert Dogs, Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Scree and Lube, That's What I Appreciate It's About You, Woman's Elite, Dancing D, Iser Plan, Stan, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, A.B., Adam Rose, Antonio Gracias, Axels, Sandy Pelica, Bellingham Acid Balls, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Chuck Buffchest, the Tarpless Goon, Commander Ben Barron of the Cheeseback Space Force, Connor, Connor Leighton, Corey Prita, Darren Fick, D-Boss, Snip Show, Derek James, Dungeon Master of Puppets, Frank Stanley, Gene Sullivan, Griffey Boy, James Pridemore, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, Derogatory, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Les Grossman's Ungodly Firestorm, Linda Hull, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Norris Sider, Ophelia, Reed, Stephen, The Hodag, The Mexinadian, The Hat123, Winging It in San Diego, ex formerly A.A. Ron, and your second favorite patron. Thank you all so very much. We'll see you next episode, which will mark more than nine years of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.